so who's ready for some science? Woo, science! <laughs> there are a lot of big, scary things out there. Climate change, pandemics, or learning that you're gonna do a TEDx talk just a few days before the talk. Well, the last one is probably a bit more of a personal problem. But on a global scale, we are facing such contradictory and complex problems. They almost seem impossible to be solved. One of these big, scary things that has been intriguing me for a while is the problem of plastic pollution. Since the 1950s, we have been producing over 9 billion tons of plastics. And yet, the global production increases year by year. We recycle only between 9 and 12 percent of all the plastics that we produce, and most of it is still burned, landfilled, or ends up in the environment. And that leads to the fact that now we have 4.9 billion tons of plastics in the environment. And that is twice as much as all the mass of all the humans, so all of us and all the animals combined. So how can we even start to solve a problem that big? Well, for me, it started with a small thing. A very small thing, indeed. Five years ago, I was still an industrial design student at the Technical University of Munich, and I was doing research in plastic pollution. I accidentally stumbled over a paper by an Italian researcher, and she found out that these little worms here, the wax worms, or also called bee worms, are capable of eating and digesting plastics. I had no clue about biology. I had zero experience in a lab. But I was totally hooked. So I dragged this thought of taking this to the next level through my studies. I did several projects about it. I watched YouTube videos about biology for dummies. And I started breeding wax worms in jam jars. And finally, in 2020, I decided to give it a real shot. So I teamed up with two biologists, and together we called our startup Bee Worm. Turns out, the worm is just a starting point. Because just like us humans, the worm has microorganisms in its stomach that helps to digest. These microorganisms, as well as the worm itself, produce enzymes. And these enzymes are like catalysts for digestive reactions. So we started isolating gut bacteria from the worm. And until this day, we found over 40 species who have the potential to degrade plastic waste. We even found species on other samples from other sources, and we discovered a novel bacteria. But the thing is, microorganisms are picky, so they like specific stuff. You need to focus on one specific material, and in our case, that material is polyethylene. Who knows what polyethylene is? Yeah, quite a few people. <laughs> so polyethylene is the world's most commonly used plastic material. Actually, you all know what it is because you use it in your daily life, in food wrappings, in bags, in foils. And this material is quite hard to crack. But these microorganisms and organisms produce these enzymes, and the enzymes act like little scissors. And they cut the long hydrocarbon molecule of polyethylene into shorter fragments. And the best thing is, these shorter fragments are like basic chemicals that can be reused to produce new plastics. We call this kind of process biocatalytic recycling. And luckily, we're not the only ones doing this. There are several teams around the world trying to do this for several types of plastics. But we all have the same problem, the scale-up. The only technology that we use right now in big scales for recycling is called mechanical recycling. Mechanical recycling is when you take plastics, you shred them down, you melt them, and you make new products out of them. And that works well for a few types of plastic, for example, for clear PET bottles that some of you have in their hands. But it doesn't work well for many other kinds of plastics. As soon as the plastic is too colored, too dirty, 
too mixed, it will not be feasible for mechanical recycling. And a lot of these plastics that are not feasible for mechanical recycling contain polyethylene. So we tried to scale up this process in a big bioreactor. The pretreatment of the plastics is actually quite similar. They get shredded and washed, and then they get put into this big bioreactor where the bioagents can do their magic. They get degraded, and what comes out there are short-chain alkanes. And these short-chain alkanes can be transformed into new plastics or other products of the petrochemical industry. And the best thing about it is that, in theory, this process can be repeated infinite times. So we really think that this could be a key technology for the plastics industry to turn it into a green and circular industry. Because imagine if we ne didn't need to use any more fossil fuels, any more oil, to produce new plastics. And imagine if the plastic waste would not be causing any more CO2 and pollution, but would be an infinite, valuable resource. I personally really like that thought. <laughs> Thank you. So I decided to replace the anxiety that I have when I think about the big, scary thing of plastic pollution with the big dream of a solution. But of course, this is not an easy path. It's not easy to be an entrepreneur, not at all. It's like entering into the rabbit hole of Alice in Wonderland. It's crazy, it's scary, it's unpredictable, and you're constantly out of your comfort zone. It's not good for your stress level, but it's worth it. And I want to bring you three key learnings that I have from this path, and that might help you to find your own path. The first one is, the expert doesn't exist. When I first started Beworm, a lot of people told me to stop and let the experts do the job. We know this saying from what was said to the climate activists when they first started. The problem that I have with this thought is, I don't know where these godlike experts are supposed to live, who can solve such complex problems, such as plastic pollution or climate change. So for me, it's all about bringing together different expertises. That's why in our team we have chemists and biologists, obviously, but also economists and designers. It's a puzzle, and everybody can be a significant piece. The next learning, and also a quote from my favorite song is, the world needs wannabes. A wannabe is defined as somebody who wants to be a specific kind of person, but it's not quite there yet. I would define myself a wannabe. It's often seen as a negative thing, but for me, it's about being bold. It's about knowing that you can get there one day and acting like it now. It's about taking your space and standing your ground, no matter if you're male or female, old or young. Girls in particular are deprived from boldness because of the social image of a nice, humble and shy woman. So sometimes it's hard to overcome that. So let's do a quick exercise. I know you already did a lot of exercises, but let's do one more. So stand up. Close your eyes. Imagine being on the subway. You have to close your eyes too, I can see you. <laughs> Imagine being Kanye West on the subway. Imagine being Kanye West on the subway and you just bought that subway because you can. And now sit down again 
like Kanye West on his first subway ride in his own subway. Who already feels a little bit bolder? <laughs> Last learning, the future is flexible. When I started Beworm, I read a book called Speculative Everything, and it really changed the way I see the future. It said that there is not one future, but there are four futures. The first one is the possible future, which contains all the futures that you can think about, the good ones and the bad ones. The second and the third one are the probable and the plausible future, which are the futures that you can calculate or that you can predict with statistics. And the last one is the preferred future. The preferred future is the future that we can shape for ourselves. And I know we all wish we would have more time to shape that future, but this is not how life works. The big, scary things don't wait for you to be ready for them. But what we can do is take all our boldness, all our expertise, all our hopes and all our dreams, and face them. Thank you.